Well, culture is something that you tend to love or you tend to hate it, and it can create a fight or flight type almost response uh, or an embrace type response. And, and I want to talk a little bit about that today. Whether you love it or hate it, you can't ignore it. Here's the thing that you may not even realize is that culture is influencing you, your friends, your family, society more than you know for good and bad. I mean, how you believe about society, about life, about your purpose, about what matters and what doesn't matter is impacting us all the time through advertisement, through social media, through movies. And some of that has been needed change. And some of that has brought a lot of confusion and mess to where people don't even know what to think anymore. You know, there are things I love about this world, uh, things that I love about present world, and there are things that are some really messy situations that I think breaks the heart of God and it also confuses me as to what is my response. You know, Scripture gives us in our text today two verses that I want to kind of start with, and then we're going to go back and unpack the whole and then draw in one reference of what Jesus says that correlates with this passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We are going to look at two verses, though, that I think I want to just kind of start and then drive my way out from. For you are all children of the light. And of the day, we don't belong to darkness and the night. So be on your guard, not asleep like others. Stay alert and be clear headed. You know, it's easy in a messy, confusing world to kind of lose sight and to not really, really sure how I feel about this or that or what I should think and And I think that really even begs a question, does how I feel about something really matter? You know, I got to be honest, it doesn't. As a follower of Christ, how I feel, for good, bad, indifferent, what matters is, is what does the designer say? What does the creator say? What does God Almighty say? And, And out of that, because he wants nothing but the best for you, for me, for this world, I, I develop my worldview based on really one thing, God's word. It's his love letter to us. It's how he speaks his truth into us. The Holy Spirit brings it alive as we allow it to. And in the midst of cultural confusion, we're we're this way, that way. No, this is right. No, that's wrong. No, let's do this. No, I, I need something that is kind of my moral compass to help me know what's right and wrong, even when my feelings say, do this. And it might be very selfish. It might be harmful to me. It might be harmful to someone else. I need something that helps me know Where am I headed? Because if you look at this life, you know, the Bible uses the picture of a storm numerous times and how, you know, God is the one in the storms of life that can actually give hope and safety in the midst of pain. And here's the thing, when you're in a storm, you're out on the waters and you're going up and down, you have no idea which way is north, south, east, west, land versus, you just don't know. You need something beyond how you feel to tell you what truth is. I'm so thankful for the word of God. You know, the confusion that surrounds us is pretty bad. The cultural confusion, there's a lot of it. And here's the thing, in that confusion and in that change, if you might say, A lot of it's just opinion. It's not right or wrong. It's just opinion. Some of it is technology just changing and society changing and figuring out how to do things better or different or just just different. It's not right or wrong once again. Hey, there are just normal shifts that occur in society. And then there is also in the midst of that very clearly in the Bible, and if you have your eyes open in this world, there is a war, a spiritual war going on between good and evil, light and darkness. And here's the thing, if not careful, we want to make everything light and darkness, good versus evil, when sometimes it's just a matter of opinion. 
And sometimes it's just shifting that needs to occur. And, and, and we don't even know who we're fighting and what we're fighting. And, and then we start lashing out in the wrong place, not the right place. Or I think there are some other things that happen. We start to play games because we're just overwhelmed. We play a game like, like you did when a kid, hide and seek. You know, it's just the other than you never want to be found. You do your best to keep your head down. You do your best to hide from this. We just got to keep the big bad world at bay. You know, this goes all the way back to biblical times. The Essenes did that. Just go live in a cave and and we'll just stay away from everything that could corrupt me. And the world's a bad place. And, you know, it's kind of interesting how people do that today in their life. God calls us to go out and be salt and light in the world, and instead we huddle up and we we don't go out and do anything in his name. We have Christian friends. We shun science. We shun uh, the idea of media because it's just all bad, and and we have a holy huddle, and we hold hands and sing kumbaya. Uh, That's not biblical. But then we can shift to the other extreme, Well, it's a war going on. I'm overwhelmed. I can't fight it. So let's just join them and we can form and blend. Well, that's not right either. Hey, you can't just say, well, here's the thing. A lot of them, what they'll do is just say, God is so full of love and grace that we just need to be tolerant of everybody. Nobody rocked the boat. And, and we just, we just, we can't fight it, so we just need to join. And, and after all, if God's going to forgive every sin I ever do, it doesn't really matter what I do. Well, no, actually, what you do does matter, and it has consequence in your life and those around you. And if you love someone, you're going to sell them sometimes things that are not easy to say. See, your beliefs don't stop on Sunday morning and making you feel good. They actually should take into your life and how you live, interact, and how you play everything day to day. Please be careful with playing that game. See, neither of those are the answer Jesus would give. Jesus calls us to be salt and light. We're going to spend some time unpacking that. See, neither of them align with God's word. How did Jesus respond to culture that matters? You know, that first verse said, be clear headed, stay alert. You know, we got to watch and because otherwise when you're overwhelmed with society, you're going to kick into fight or flight and you're going to do something. Fight or flight is a good natural response God gave us to survive in a moment. It's not a way to live day to day. And so let me just challenge you to say, how would Jesus respond? Well, you look at his life. If you're a follower of Christ, we remember that our allegiance is to him, to God. And in fact, our citizenship is not here, it's there. And that this world is just a temporary place and I'm passing through to eternity with him. I'm gonna live way more there than here. And that changes That changes how I live. That changes how I interact. That changes my values. It changes my beliefs. It changes everything. You know, your lifestyle, if you follow Jesus, isn't likely to align with the churchy world, and it's not going to align with the worldly side of things. Jesus was a radical, and that when it comes down to it, he was holy to the core. I mean, Pure and holy, without sin. I mean, a faith that is incredible. It was amazing as you read about who he was and how he was set apart. And we go, yeah, we need to stand on truth. And that is a part of Jesus. He defines truth. But the, it's not an either or with him. He also defines, on the other hand, love and grace and everything that he did and the truth that he has is fully flavored by this love for the world that we live in, even the broken and messy people. And if that wasn't true, you would have no hope because there's not one perfect person in this church. Not, not one. There's only one who's ever lived. His name was Jesus. And he balanced this incredible love and truth. And he basically ticked off the religious leaders of the time. He, he made the messiest of people feel welcome and loved. And, and it was such a confusing way because the church went, 
you can't love them. They're messy. And he's like, yeah, just like you. (gasps) And they're offended. So the church ended up at the time hating him. He didn't fit their mold. The political leaders, they, they were fascinated by him, yes, but they also feared him. And the disciples, while totally confused and didn't know what to do next a lot of times, they were drawn to him. Because this Jesus that we follow, he's loving and he offers grace and yet he speaks the hard truths into us that we need to know there's never been anyone like Jesus. And he has called us in this passage, let me jump over in a complimentary passage in Matthew 5 to say our calling. He says, from Jesus' words, you are the salt of the earth to us his followers. What good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? Well, it'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. No, instead, a lamp is placed up on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your life, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise, not you, but your heavenly Father. See, we take salt and light for granted. We read something like that and we're like, salt and light, okay, whatever. One of the cheapest spices you can buy is salt. You just go to your cabinet, pour it out, no big deal. This was a very valuable commodity when they did not have refrigeration. This cured their meat, that preserved things, all kinds of good that came from salt. And a light, you don't even think anything of it. You just go click the light on. You don't worry about it. But light for them was existence. And so they worked during the day, and as soon as night came, they had to shut it down. They didn't have light. They didn't have generators. They didn't have a light switch to turn on. And only those who could afford to be able to have light source could actually have that. So these are two valuable commodities. And he said, hey, this is what you are called to be. You are valuable. You're important. You're a part of the very essence of the health of life that this world needs. Now go be salt and light. So let's unpack this in our text just a little bit. We're going to go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and go from 1 through 11. It says, now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin and there will be no escape. I know some say, oh, finally, we're going to talk about end times. So what is it, Pastor? Let me just give you a quick summary of end times. Nobody knows when it's going to happen. He will come back. He wins. We need to be ready, okay? So often we're so... No one knows the end and how it'll happen and when it'll happen, but it will happen. This is a warning to the church, not to the lost world. This is a warning to the church. I'm coming back. Are you doing your job? Are you ready? Because he's going to shift right into, hey, I'm, the father's coming back. Are you doing your job? And that's something that we miss so often in the land of much. Little is actually appreciated. See, here's the thing. We read scripture. We sit down, kick back, put our feet up. We are fat, sassy, happy, and lazy Christians. That's just the truth. American Christians, we tend to be fat, sassy, and just have, we just, we don't really worry about want. We say, oh, I'm so poor. We're all eating. I don't see a single person in this room starving. Sorry. I'm not calling you fat. I'm just saying we're we're all healthily fed. And, 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 And the thing is, is because of that, we have no urgency of Christ's return. We have no urgency of people dying and going to hell. We have no urgency to go out and share the gospel. And that's messed up when it comes to the biblical view of things. It's something that we cannot hide from. It's something we cannot avoid. And so Christ will return. And here's the question. As the church, are you being salt and light? It really comes down to one simple question. Whose are you? It's a question I ask myself regularly. It's something I've thought about. In fact, just whose kid are you? 
Whenever I think about it, let me just tell a quick story that helps me illustrate this. Is years ago, uh, we were in Yellowstone. I was a little tyke. I, I'm not sure what age, but I was pretty small, and, and I can barely remember it. And, but my dad told me the story of this. He says, we pull over on the side of the road, and there's a moose, and everybody's like, oh, you know, and that's when the rangers are always nervous because you get too close to a moose of the deer family. Most deer run, elk run, others run, moose stomp. And so they, 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 they feel threatened. They will attack more than the others. And so everybody's kind of watching. And then all of a sudden, someone in the crowd goes, whose kid is that? And dad looks. Oh, Barry, the little guy walks right over to the moose. I got loose. And, uh, and, and, And so I'm just like, wow, it's so brilliant. I'm just thinking this is great, I'm sure. And I have no fear of it because it's just a big fuzzy animal to me. And, and, and here's the thing. Now, for some of you, you go, well, but what happened? Well, dad's off to the side and he's like, Barry, Barry. He didn't want to scare the moose. He didn't want to stir it up, but he's trying to get me to back off, even though I don't know there's any danger. I finally did back off, but here's the parallel for us. How many of us in society have kind of edged up to society? We edge up to the world around us. We edge up to the culture, and we don't even know it's a moose that wants to stomp us, and it doesn't care about our future, and it can leave us in a really bad place if we're not careful. The heavenly Father's going, hey, hey, come back. He's not holding out on you. He's not wanting you to miss out on all the good stuff. He's not wanting to just scold you or judge you. He's saying, back off, I have a better plan for you. And I think so often we just forget simply whose we are. We're his. He's the creator. He's the father. I'm the child. He's the one, is the potter. I'm the clay. He's the designer. I'm the creation. So whose are you? Are you listening to his voice? Have you wandered off because he's called you into a family? And it's a beautiful thing. You know, he reminds the Thessalonican in the next two uh, verses, verses four and five, of their family, of their who they belong to. And it says, but aren't, you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters. Now, they weren't actually brothers and sisters. They're spiritual brothers and sisters. The family of God And you won't be surprised when the day of our Lord comes like a thief because you're expectantly looking for your father. For you are all children of the light. He is the light. And of the day, we don't belong to this world, to the darkness or the night. I need that reminder just to be blunt. I need to remember that he's my father, that I belong to him. Because there are times that I get caught up in my hurt. Sometimes I get caught up in my selfishness. Sometimes I get caught up in just the stuff of this world and the pleasures. And I got to remember, hey, I don't belong to me. I belong to him. So whose kid are you? And are you listening to your heavenly dad's voice? Or are you listening to your own? Or are you listening to culture instead? Who do you belong to? In fact, what, what does your life say about who you belong to? Does your life scream out that you belong to your heavenly father? Or does it actually say you belong to this world and you've gotten a little too close to the moose? I think what happens as Christians when we think it just doesn't matter And we think that we're a little more in control and we give him our Sundays, but not really give him our heart as we become consumer Christians. It's just what's in for me. What am I going to get out of this? I like it one day. I don't like it another day. I agree with him this day. I don't agree on another day. I I, I like the music this time. I don't like the music this time. And, And we just come in and we evaluate and we say all of our stuff and then we're done and we don't go out and live the life he's called us to because it's all about consuming. Do you realize God has called you to be a light in a dark world? 
This is a beautiful thing that should shine through us. As he shines his love and his light into us, it should reflect into those around us. Jesus wants us to be salty. He wants us to be salted with God's truth. And he wants us to be the light that is a hope in the dark world around us. And please hear me, you can absolutely be part of him changing this world if you let him change you first. See, you can't give what you don't have. Let me say that again. It's something I'm going to say many times over the years. You can't give what you don't have. Too often, we want to say, God, give me to throw. That's a weapon. God, impact me so that I can be. That changes everything. If you take truth from here and just throw it in people's face, they're never going to listen to that. It, it's not God's way. That's not what you read in the New Testament, taking here and throwing here. God's way is always taking here, putting here, and then going out and being the hands and feet. And what is spoken is spoken with his heart and his truth, this incredible balance that, that we don't know how to do a lot of times. We want to be truth or we want to be love. And he says, be both. And so, friends, we must be prepared. We got to understand the heart of the Father. A soldier does not go into battle with just a T-shirt and some sandals. They get prepared. They train. They go through. They put on the whole armor. You know, read over Ephesians 6 on the armor of God, this powerful picture of, of letting him influence and protect and be our whole identity. That same analogy is used here in verses 6 and 8. It says, be on your guard, not asleep like the others, a soldier does not fall asleep on the job. In fact, at that point, if you fell asleep on the job, it was your life that would take it from you. Stay alert. Be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected, protected by the armor of faith and love. And that the very confidence of what you have is wearing it as the helmet, the confidence of our salvation, that we're loved by a God on high, that we're forgiven, that we're given a hope, we have a place in him. Hold on to that. See, so often we miss that there's a spiritual war going on. And the only people that we actually fight, well, it's our family. I hate that I can be so professional and caring and loving, think about my words and, and not let anything ever slip when I'm in public and then I come home to the ones I love the most and, I, and I'll snap and I'm like, I'm so sorry, honey. I'll snap at my kids or I'll snap at somebody else. Why? Because I'm relaxed around them. I'm comfortable around them. And some of that's good, but some of it's bad. And, and so just as a side note, if you do that, if you struggle with that, and most of you probably have at some point, I say a simple little prayer. It changed my life. Years ago, I started doing it. As I pull into the house, I just say, God, I'm getting ready to meet the most important person I'm going to meet all day. Help me to treat him that way. And this changes how you interact. So you don't let your guard down. You actually keep it up in a good way. Open, vulnerable, yes, but loving and real and thoughtful, yes. So when it comes into the church, how do we make the same application? See, if, if you're not fighting the battle out there, if you're not going out and witnessing, if you're not seeing the light and the darkness and the war that's going on for the souls of people around, what happens then? You come into where we're supposed to be prepared, encouraging, watch each other's back, and I don't like how David did that. I don't like how you did that. I don't like her. You know, I'm, and all of a sudden it can become the very thing that we do at home. We start to fight over things that just don't matter rather than be who God has called us to be. So what are you doing to prepare and to train? Because I can only give you this much, just, just this much of your weekly need for nutrition spiritually. I give you an appetizer on Sunday morning. If all you do is come to church, stick your tongue out, uh, I'm hungry, and then I give you a little baby food uh, appetizer, and you don't eat till next Sunday, and then you maybe miss a Sunday, and you might go two weeks without eating, how spiritually healthy are you going to be? You gotta learn to feed yourself 
and then come together and get challenged here, yes, get some different appetizer ideas, and then go out and feed yourself. So what are you doing to prepare for this war that is going on? And when you do, now when things come in, this preparing is about learning, it's about growing, it's about deepening, it's about developing, it's about knowing God's heart. That's going to have to come out because that's what God's love does. It comes in and it goes out. God's knowledge comes in and it ought to go out. Yet when it comes out, what should it always be flavored with? The next one is always love. Always love. Verse 8 says the very armor that we have is faith and love. That love is this New Testament core theme. And some of are, I just don't really like it. Well, I'm so thankful we have his love. I would be lost and headed for hell without his love. See, it's his love that Jesus ended up on the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then we, on the other hand, start to struggle with that. And we start to dish out anger instead of love. You know what? And it comes into us. If we've received his love, it must flow from us. It says in verse 9 here in our text, for God chose to save us through the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son, not to pour out his anger on us. But then somehow the church starts to pour out its anger. You know, it's unfortunate that, it's so unfortunate that so often the world hears our convictions but doesn't see our love and our grace. See, here's the thing, and I don't miss this. It does not matter how right you are if it's not communicated in the love of God. See, it's truth spoken in love is what it is. And, and we want to, well, I said it softly, and I put a smiley face. That doesn't mean squat. It doesn't matter how, the, what is your motivation? What is your heart? Truth in love. See, here is, if I have that flavor, if I've, if I've received his love and it starts to go out, you know something that's always going to be a part of my life is if I'm following Jesus, I got to love as he did. How did he love? He sacrificed. And so willingly sacrifice is the next, willingly sacrifice, not willing to sacrifice. Everybody's willing to sacrifice occasionally. That means occasionally I might sacrifice my time. Occasionally I might do something for somebody. No, willingly sacrifice, present tense, continual, regular, 365 days, I'm sacrificing because that's what Jesus did. So it flavors my time, it flavors my finances, it flavors my values, it flavors my love, it flavors my marriage, it flavors my friendships, it flavors my hobbies, it flavors my work. I'm going to willingly sacrifice because that is the very essence of of God's love for us, it's sacrificial. He went to the cross and I receive grace and you receive grace. You know, the Bible tells us in verse 10 that Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. You know, the most humbling part of the service for me is communion. That to remember that I, in my imperfection, I, in my mess, I, in my brokenness, as a sinner, had God look upon me and say, Barry, here's how much I love you. I'll send my son to die on a cross in your place. That's some serious love, guys. Let me If you have the elements at home, would you please grab some bread, some crackers, some juice, whatever you have. And those here in the balcony on the main level, the elements are available to you on your seat or at the exit door. I'd like to partake of this together. See, the elements are just simply this. It's a tradition that's been going on for a couple thousand years since Jesus instituted it with his disciples. He set his disciples around. They were drawn to him, but confused, misunderstanding often. And he says, okay, this is what love is. I'm getting ready to die for the world. And they're like, huh? He says, just remember, this is what's going to represent my body and my blood. And it's going to make sense to you in a little while. He's basically telling them, and they still don't get it. He says, but as long as you come together, until I return, partake in this to remember basically my love for you. And so 2,000 years later, we still do it. 
He said, take the body represented here in this piece of bread that'll be broken that you might have life. Take and eat. He passed a cup and said, take and drink. This represents my blood that'll be shed for you. For just a moment, I want you to stay silent and I'll give you a few things to think about. But if this is the example of his love for us, can I ask you, as you just sit and think for a little bit after taking those elements, how well do you love? As you continue to ponder, how well do you love when someone disagrees with you morally, politically, or spiritually? How well do you love? Jesus was a friend of the messiest broken people in society. And that's what gives you and gives me hope. Could I challenge you as the church? Don't belittle people. Don't ignore them. Know that in Christ, they need to be loved and you might be the only Jesus they ever encounter. Are you reflecting him? I know some of you go, but Barry, this is hard. It's scary. I don't know if I'll be rejected. And then some people are just downright mean. And well, guess what? You're not meant to go alone. One last point I want to share with you. Let me conclude with this. We are better together. We are better together. Say that with me. We are better together. Say it again. We are better together. One more time. We are better together. You can't do this alone. If you go out and try and say, I'm just going to be the Lone Ranger Christian. I love him and I can do it by myself. You will be defeated. You will be discouraged and you will be downcast. That's part of what it is. We are not designed to go alone. You know, that's part of why we come together on a Sunday morning. That's why I have a life group I'm a part of. That's why I meet with others. That's why I connect in the body of Christ. I am to go out and be a salt and light in the world, but I also come in together and say, support and encourage me, and I will you. See, I need you. You need me. We need each other, and we're better together. We get so easily discouraged. That's why the Bible tells us here in, in verse 11, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you already do. You know, we're going to talk a lot about encouragement next week. I hope that you come back. You're part of it. It's one of our weakest areas in, I, I think, in church life and as followers. We're just not very good as a society at really encouraging. So I want to ask you, because when we did this survey with our on the street thing, it was the weakest video of all of them. And uh, people were like, uh, so how have you encouraged? Uh, so what would people say around you? If we interviewed your friends, your family, your coworkers, your neighbor, what would they say about you? What, what would they say ought to change about your actions, your attitudes, your life? Because I think the church has been pretty good about speaking truth. And it's not been very good about actively living out that truth and his love. God wants to change this world and he will use you as his instrument if you let him. But it must begin at home with the man or the woman who's in the mirror. You let him impact you, and then you reflect that out. You let him impact you, and then you love and give that out. 
His light is never meant to just be my light. It's to be a light for those in darkness. I'm going to say a prayer, and I just want to challenge you during this prayer time to just say, God, what needs to change in my life? Am I being the salt and the light? Am I really yours? And if not, make that change today. Let's pray. Oh, God, thank you for caring and listening to us. God, I'm so thankful that you put up with messy people because I'm a messy one. Lord, I ask that you would just fall on each person listening right now, that you would speak into them, that you would whisper their name and draw them back to you away from this world, that, Lord, they would... They would hear your voice as one who is trustworthy and loving and caring, that they would allow you to transform them, that they could go out and be your light in this broken world. God, I pray that they are encouraged here, but this isn't the end of it all. I pray that they're lifted up right now, but that they would go and be the church as you've called them to be. We need you desperately. This world needs you. I need you. God, shine through us. In Jesus' name we pray.